<laughs> test that's going to be tomorrow. Um, remember, test tomorrow, and here's what it's going to look like. Um, basically, we have done three chapters. The three chapters we have talked about are four, five, and six, if you happen to have a hard copy of the book. Um, and each chapter is going to be represented on the test equally, and each chapter is going to be represented by 10 multiple choice questions. So that means the test is going to be 30 multiple choice questions that are going to be on the test. Personally, I am not really a big fan of multiple choice questions, but given the fact that we need a way to do this test securely and to do it efficiently, um, multiple choice is going to be um, the devil we're going to dance with, so to speak. So um, that's the way it's going to work, uh, at least for at least this test. Um, but anyways, I want to make sure we talk some specifics about what you're going to see on the test. Um, there's a lot of content we've covered since we had our last exam, and uh, you're going to see a little bit of everything. Um, the test is um, it's definitely longer than the last one we did, so I want to encourage you to think about making sure when you're going through this test that you are working efficiently to be able to do this. But um, here are the overall titles of what we're looking at. So chapter four. In chapter four, what we really started off with is we were talking about kind of the structure. How is an atom put together? The structure of the atom. All right, chapter five was the chapter where we spent a lot more time looking at electrons. And then chapter six is the one that we just wrapped up, which was about the periodic table. And the periodic law. And when we put those two together, we end up with a pretty good explanation. Basically, by the time we got to the end of chapter six, we now have what we call a modern, full blown version of what we use as a periodic table today. So, this test is, like I said, it's, it's pretty involved, and we're going to give you some details of what I expect you to know for the test. But in general, the rule of thumb that you should always use is if we talked about it in class, it's probably something that was significant and that's something that you're going to be assessed over. All right. But chapter four was really broken apart into four different chunks. Um, and that was each one of these chunks was a lesson in cinch. So if you want to go back and if you're a person who likes to reread, go back and reread those four sections in cinch. I literally just kind of went through cinch as I was writing this test and I said, that's important. Need to talk about that. That's important. That's important. And really, you can probably do the same thing. What I'm going to show you here. So the first section was called the early ideas. And within the early ideas, there were really two, uh, two broad stroked early ideas. And one came to us from the ancient Greeks. And there were really two that the book focused on, Aristotle and Democritus. Uh, those were two that really we kind of honed in on. And remarkably, the stuff that they understood about matter and atoms, was a lot of it was good. They actually had a lot of stuff right, which is amazing. <coughs> this was on the order of like 300 B.C. We're talking, you know... 2,300 years ago is when we first came, Democritus came up with the idea of an atom. That's amazing. Um, turns out he had some of it right and he had some of it wrong. And later, this the views changed when we met a guy named John Dalton. And John Dalton came much later in the early 1800s He is the guy who comes along and kind of fills in some of the gaps and starts really kind of moving out of earth, wind, fire, and water and moving it into, no, we've actually got a pretty involved different set of uh, atoms that are out there. Both of these, the ancient Greeks and John Dalton, got some of it right. Both of them got some of the early ideas about matter wrong. I am going to ask you 
What was it they had right? What was it they had wrong? So you should know the basic ideas that these two groups believed. What was right about what they had and what they, they have was wrong. So they will show up in sort of in that format. Um, the second section under chapter 4 was where we looked at how we come up with a definition or how we define the atom. And no doubt the big difference that came from the ancient Greeks to where we're at today is this transition from looking at just our early our life experiences and explaining it based off of what we see to now moving into a world of experimentation. So everything was done off of these experiments. Right? And so there were some important experiments that were done. And they were done by some very some people who ultimately ended up turning out to be very famous because of their significant experiments. The three people that we kind of focused on was Thompson, Milliken, and Rutherford. <laughs> and of those three guys, each one of them had an experiment that ended up kind of revealing a little bit about the nature of the atom and how it's put together you know and some of them each one of them had their own contribution so what I'm going to ask you to know is really you know what was their experiment but even more than what their experiment was about I want to know what did they find out what did they discover A great example of this would be to say that Rutherford used the uh, a stream of alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold to show, and the deflection as he shot these particles into the gold show that there must be nucleus, a nuclei, inside of these gold particles, that there must be a nucleus in there. He, so he gets credit for what we call the nuclear model of the atom. That's what all of you drew on that study guide where you drew those particles coming into the nucleus and then being deflected out of there. So, they all did something important that helped reveal what we now know as the subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Make sure that you are comfortable with what they did and kind of really what did they discover. Those will be show up in some regard on the test. So, um, make sure you're good with them. Um, the third section in, on this chapter was what we call How Atoms Differ, is the way it was titled. And really in this one is where we started kind of really trying to take a real close scale at what's going on with the scale of what this model of the inside of the atom. And, and where we're at on a lot of these is the idea that we have, of course, a nucleus. And we have these electrons that go on in some sort of orbit around them. And you've all seen that, certainly drawn probably in that configuration, I would guess, since middle school. But really, what does it mean? And how does this really work is kind of what this section is about. And what can we possibly understand from this? And really what we're drawing, when we draw it this way, is we're actually not drawing simply an atom, we're drawing more specifically an isotope. Right? And what is an isotope? Well, it, an isotope is just a specific configuration of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right? And we usually express that in terms of the name of the element and then the mass of that element. So for example, up here I have an element that has two protons. So what element did I draw? Helium. This is helium. Helium, we know this is helium because it has two protons, so it has an atomic number of two. But then helium, the isotope way to write this would be helium-4, referring to then the four is the mass number. And what does the mass number tell us? The mass number tells you protons plus 
neutrons. The name is going to tell you the protons. And we are going to assume for the sake of argument that the number of protons also equals the number of electrons. So that is how we deal with this sort of isotope notation and really using that is going to be, I'm going to ask you to be able to take this and figure out how many protons, neutrons, and electrons do we have in a given isotope. So I'm going to give you one and say how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in there. You should all know how to do this. We have done that many times by now, right? And if um, we were to look at one of these, if the, the thing of it, though, is when we look at the periodic table, it's not written like this. We don't see helium-4. It's written like this. If I was to do carbon, I know carbon off the top of my head. It's carbon-6, and then at the bottom it says 12.0001 or something of that sort, or 12.001. Right, well, the top is, of course, the atomic number. The bottom is the mass number. But it's really more than that, because how can we, whenever we look at all of the different spots in the periodic table, the mass is not a, it's not a whole number. So how can that not be a whole number if I just told you down here that the mass number is protons plus neutrons? How do we have a thousandth or even half of a neutron. Well, that's because this mass number is more than just a mass number when we see it on the periodic table. This is the average atomic mass for all the known isotopes, or at least all the common isotopes in their percent abundance. Remember, we did that problem on the study guide where you looked at, at um, copper and they gave you an isotope for copper and another isotope for copper and then their percent abundance. You had to figure out what it was based off of its average atomic mass. The periodic table is showing you the average atomic mass. It's not necessarily for any individual isotope. Although for carbon, it's a great example that the vast majority of time, carbon shows up as carbon-12. Every once in a while, we see a carbon-13. So that is where that uh, sort of notation comes from. All right? The last thing that was in chapter 4 that was of significance I wanted to take a look at is what we call it was the radioactive decay. And I'm not going to go into great detail with radioactive decay because this is really a subject that goes really far, really fast. But the idea that I want you to know is the little um, drawing that we dealt with. The little thing where we had some sort of a source that was emitting radioactive uh, particles, and those radioactive particles were passed through a area that had a charge, where we had a positive charge and a negative charge, and what we saw is that there are three different types of radioactive decay, right? where we saw one source that when it went through here was deflected up this way. It was effectively attracted to the negatively charged side. That one was what we called alpha decay. Right? We saw another one that was deflected downward towards the positive side. This is what we called beta decay. Then we saw another one that was seemingly unaffected altogether and it just went straight through. Right? This is what we call gamma. So the fact that when we send these different sources through here, we can see that they have a net charge. One being positive, one being negative, and one being neutral. And well, they are totally different types of particles. And I'm not, it doesn't matter too much really what they are, but I want you to know the significance of their charge and how we found that out. On that note, that is the end of the review for Chapter 4. Does anyone have any questions about Chapter 4?